Immortality is an amazing game. I was a bit late to the party on this one. Having seen it in about 10 different Game of the Year lists, I decided I should give it a whirl just a couple of weeks ago. And so I picked it up on Steam. It's received glowing praise from pretty much every publication that's reviewed it. For me, it does have one or two flaws, and I'll get into those later, but there's no denying that it's a technical marvel, that the acting is of very high quality, and that the, if I may be so pretentious, emergent gameplay is pretty cool stuff indeed. So, seeing as my channel is called a Retro Mule and not a Modern Mule, I thought it appropriate to take a look at the game in the context of the FMV games of yore, and to see how far, or not far, we've come since those days. Technically speaking, FMV games have been around for donkey's years, with stuff like Astro Belt and Dragon's Lair arriving way back in the 1980s. This is in no way, shape or form going to be a complete exhaustive list. I'm going to try and pick out the titles that I think have particular significance in the canon of FMV titles. And for that reason, I'm going to skip ahead to the great early mid 90s wave of FMV titles that hit the PC and Mega CD back in the day. We have a picture. I'm Commander Sims of the Sega Control Attack Team. Scat Mission 230. Five teenage girls have disappeared after spending the night at the old Lakeshore Winery House of Mr. and Mrs. Victor Martin and their children, Jeff and Sarah. Right now, another five girls are headed towards the Martins to spend the night. Your mission? Protect those girls from whatever happened to the last ones. Now listen up. Last night, one of our agents got into the house and found some kind of weird security system. Oxydokes, Night Trap, caused a huge stir back in the Mega CD days, famously being discussed in the 1993 U.S. Senate hearings on video games. The second game is Night Trap, which is a game set in a sorority house. The object is to keep hooded men from hanging the young woman from a hook or drilling their necks with a tool designed to drain their blood. Night Trap uses actual actors and achieves an unprecedented level of realism. What is particularly troubling about the scene uh, in this uh, film that, that we have an extract, extract of is a graphic depiction of the violence against women with uh, strong overtones of sexual violence. I find this segment deeply offensive and believe that it simply should be taken off the market. memory serves, it was the first big FMV title that I played, and even though the mechanics were largely, uh, impossible, the game had bags and bags of campy 80s charm, and it's a very memorable title indeed. It's true that unless you sat there with about three years worth of spare time, pens and paper, this thing was fucking impossible to finish without a guide, but you know what? Even with a guide, it was still pretty good fun. I remember the reviews being not so glowing at the time. That's the thing about FMV games for me. It wasn't the format itself that was the problem, but the developers usually implemented it in a rather inelegant way. 
and it often revolved around pretty cliche genre B-movie stuff like vampires, uh, vampires, alien vampires, and also Dracula. Alright, a lot of vampires, come to think of it. It's true that the games were somewhat limited by the technology itself. CDs could only hold a limited amount of grainy, hugely compressed video in those days, whereas modern games like Her Story or Immortality feature several hours of high-quality footage. But essentially, the developers seemed unable to come up with a particularly compelling way of how to use the tech. For those who haven't played 90s console FMV games, there were, to my mind, two main formats. One involved Shenmue-style QTE-type inputs on games like Road Avenger or Dragon's Lair, where you'd simply watch the footage and press the right button at the right time using the on-screen prompts. Simple and a bit shite. The other main type was the Night Trap Ground Zero Texas security camera style thing, where you'd have a multi-camera setup and would have to switch at the appropriate time to zap or trap your enemies. In both of these particular games, it was almost completely arbitrary where and when the enemies were going to pop up, so really, you'd have to either memorize the whole fucking thing, or do the same thing and just use a guide instead. Also, half the time you couldn't actually watch the plot development type stuff because there were aliens slash vampires popping up at the same time elsewhere, which was probably an attempt by the developers to add replayability, etc, etc, but really, it's just... shit. I will say, however, that the actual FMV content of both games is definitely entertaining, atmospheric, and camp as Christmas. Anyway, needless to say, both of these formats were... not ideal. There were exceptions, however, and I would argue that the PC FMV games of that time were quite a bit more successful than their console cousins. I didn't actually play Phantasmagoria at the time, because my family didn't have a PC back then, but this game had a definite notoriety. Unfortunately, this was due largely to the sex and violence, and the much-discussed rape scene. Exploitative it may have been, although it was in fact designed by Roberta Williams, a bona fide genuine lady person, but regardless, this game had bags of atmosphere, lots of gratuitous bonking and gore, and it did actually have a somewhat substantial, cohesive, and uh, earnestly acted story, and it also had CG sets that made the Star Wars prequels look convincing. It's true that in the PC space most FMV games were basically point and clicks dressed in new clothes, but it was still a pretty effective use of the tech, at least compared to the stuff they were putting out on console. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special report. Good evening. Unexpected meteor showers have been reported over North America, Europe, and Asia, causing widespread damage and disruption to many communication systems. The National Weather Service reports... <laughs> Control room, what is going on in... Al, what is... What the hell is going on? Major Stewart, you getting this? Affirmative. Commander Crane, unidentified flying objects approaching Earth. Plot their approach vector and sound red alert. My God. There are thousands of them. Now, in some ways, things improved on the console front as we moved into the Saturn and PS1 era. Video clips in games are so quotidian and unremarkable these days 
but it's hard to describe quite how novel and cool they seemed when we moved from cartridges onto high-capacity CDs. I remember playing the otherwise rather crap 3D spaceship shooter Shockwave Assault on a PS1 back in 95, probably, and being amazed at the insane quality of the video clips. Around the same time, I played Wing Commander 3 with my big brother while renting, yes, renting a PS1 console and playing it huddled up around the 21-inch CRT in his freezing cold attic bedroom, and we were completely absorbed by the FMV sequences, featuring actors I actually knew and loved, camping about on the screen in what was for the time very high quality. In some ways you could say that the developers had kind of given up on trying to integrate FMV into the gameplay, and were just basically bookmarking the 3D action with admittedly quite nicely produced movie clips. But at least this system worked, both from a gameplay and a cinematic perspective. your father. Laura, go back. You must not cross over to this side. This is another world born of my own mind. Laura, go back. Come further and your world will be closed off from you. Laura, I'm... One game that did integrate the FMV and gameplay a bit more tightly was D, which we also played around the same time, a super atmospheric, foreboding and disquieting horror game from auteur game designer Kenji Ino, sadly no longer with us. I'd love to see what he would have been getting up to these days had he lived. In this game, you had to explore what was basically a haunted mansion and uncover the secret of your missing father. This game was entirely FMV, and although interaction was a bit limited, you could only really move mist-style in four directions and interact with objects. Being the slow-paced game that it was, the system worked pretty well, and given the very limited nature of real-time 3D at that time, the use of pre-rendered footage 
was most definitely justified, I think. Also, it had that atmosphere. My family finally got a PC in 1997, and one FMV game that really stays with me is the X-Files game. I got this one along with Banjo-Kazooie on the N64 for my 14th birthday in the summer of 98, and although it was by no means the greatest game ever made, it was very well written and acted by FMV game standards, had very solid production values, and a fantastic sense of place. Hey, come on in. Well, congratulations, old-timer. I don't know what you were doing, but you just warranted the involvement of the federal government. Lucky you. So what have you got? Well, Agent Wilmore, barring any unexpected revelation, looks like somebody shot this man in the back of the head. So what was the time of death? Well, preliminarily, I'd say he's been dead for about six hours, so that would make the time of death early in the a.m. Again, it was basically in the traditional point-and-click format, with a few modifications, but the way the game was framed and written, from a largely first-person perspective, for me, increased the level of immersion substantially when compared to other games of that period. That's aside, of course, from the awesome x files vibes, courtesy of the excellent score from Mark Snow. Whose theory do you believe, Mulders or Scully's? Scully's obviously a by-the-book agent. I think it's great to hear of a detective who's a creative thinker. I'm looking forward to meeting Agent Mulder. And some beautifully chunky late 90s mobile phones, and not to mention this fucking stellar big box packaging. Let me just show you this for a minute.
Now, despite these outliers, FMV games quickly became deeply unfashionable in the 90s, as somewhat complex 3D games became a reality. In the gaming press, in the UK at least, FMV games became a byword for shit. They were somewhat unfairly derided for their B-movie actors' extremely limited interactivity and laughably grainy video quality. But there was always a lot of potential there. For me, there was always something inherently unique, uncanny, and fascinatingly unsettling about playing an FMV game. Something about the medium itself really put me in a different place. Interacting in whatever limited way with real-life actors on screen does have a quality unique from sprites or real-time 3D. Even if the game was absolute cack, for some reason almost all the FMV games I've played over the years have lived long in my memory, and from time to time I still find myself pining to go back to that world, be it the X-Files, Ground Zero Texas, or even the all-time classic that is Slam City with Scotty Pippin. Your ball, Junior! Give up the ball. See, <laughs> white man can't jump! Anyway, we skip ahead again to the modern era, and FMV games suddenly, somehow, made a comeback. And now, finally, they're using them to something like their full potential. I've by no means played all these things, but as a general rule, the quality of these modern interactive movies is quite a dramatic improvement over the bulk of the 90s stuff. There are numerous titles by Wales Interactive, amongst others, that have seen some success, not to mention Erica, which I played and enjoyed on PS4, but one man stands head and at least one shoulder above the others in this particular genre. A man who sounds like a character on Coronation Street, Sam Barlow. 2015's Her Story marked the return of the FMV game in popular consciousness, whatever that means, and what a game it is. According to his Wikipedia page, apparently Barlow is a fan of British, ostensibly science fiction writer J.G. Ballard, and the cut-up technique Ballard employed, along with the likes of William Burroughs and even David Bowie, seems to have been an influence on the design of this extremely clever and absorbing game. A wuzza wuzza. I wanted something that reflected the texture of everyday life in the 60s. There was this sense that we were living entirely in a media landscape. It was very difficult to tell what was real and what was false. And I wanted to convey something of the, of the feeling of what it was like to be bombarded from all sides. And particularly if you were having a nervous breakdown, you might well see the world as, as it's shown in the, in the atrocity exhibition. The thing to do is don't start reading page one and, and start at random, anywhere. If you find a paragraph that intrigues you, read it. It will probably set up resonances in your mind. Move on and look at the adjacent paragraphs. Soon, it will begin to assemble a portrait of something probably close to everyday reality. That's about as succinct a summation of the basic flow of Barlow's games as you could possibly wish for, really. And the system works very well indeed. I thought her story and telling lies were fascinating, well acted, and as all FMV games should be, weirdly unsettling. But Immortality is another step up in terms of its budget, its complexity, and its level of ambition. It features around 10 hours of footage, three fictional movies, and an overarching plot that is completely nuts. I think the attempt to make mock period footage complete with faded colours, pop marks, and period detail is kind of cool if not terribly convincing, there's some magnificently bad faux 60s wigs on display for one thing, but it's just the scale and the ambition of the whole package that makes it so impressive. Now then, what about the flaws? Well, despite all the ambition and craft of immortality, I actually think the overarching story overreaches itself a little bit, 
when the character of the other starts coming into things and we start to take off on a gods, demons, bald, scary, evil eyes lady tangent, I think it all gets a little bit too self-consciously highbrow and abstract, and the presence of such overtly supernatural stuff actually detracts quite a bit from the fantastic work they do to set up the character of Marissa Marcel. I'm not saying I want an overly literal explanation for her disappearance, but it's all a bit detached and on the nose for my tastes. I think it's going for this kind of Lynchian vibe whereby different spiritual realms are interacting and colliding with each other, but in Lynch's films, for example, this is kept highly abstract and very much up to the viewer's interpretation, whereas this stuff is much more literal. In my opinion, there's a slight lack of integration of these two elements of the game. The supernatural stuff feels kind of plunked on top of the meat and potatoes of the game, and it just doesn't quite gel together. This will depend somewhat on at what point you reach the end credits of the game, and whether you carry on your investigations after they've rolled, because there's lots of material knitting the whole thing together. But still, the hook just doesn't quite sit right with me. The Guardian suggests that the game is an exploration of the treatment of women in Hollywood. There's probably some truth to that, but like most articles in The Guardian, I'm not entirely convinced. Anyway, because of this, I actually think her story in particular works a bit better than this one. But look, I'm only being critical because I rate this game so highly. Immortality is an amazing experience, probably the most memorable of the whole year for me, regardless of genre, and I'd encourage everyone to at least give it a whirl. You might love it, or you might not, but I can pretty much guarantee that one way or another, it will be one of the most affecting gaming experiences you've had in ages. So, there we are, FMV games. Well, I think we're supposed to call them interactive movies now, as the term FMV, like the bulk of my games collection, is a bit archaic. Anyway, for me, this is one area of gaming where, despite my fondness for the FMV games of yesteryear, you just have to hold your hands up and say that things have improved by almost every conceivable metric, albeit mostly due to the work of one man. True, his games are no Mad Dog McCree, Let's see what kind of a shot you are, Pilgrim. Take a crack at this bottle. <laughs> <laughs> you missed that one. Try another. No, he doesn't. <laughs> you missed that one. Try another. <laughs> <laughs> you missed that one. Try another. <laughs> <laughs> you missed that one. Try another. <laughs> but still, you can't help but admire this man's skill and sheer gumption at elevating a much maligned genre to such heights. Hopefully, we'll see more games from different developers who take cues from Sam Barlow's games and use them to take us on a journey to some more strange, frightening, and wonderful places. And if not, at least we'll always have Slam City with Scotty Pippen for company. You're bald, Junior! Ah! Yeah. Oh!